And then, as Justin said, um, yeah, Fiona, I'm the general manager for um, Hearth Allied Health now. And I um, yeah, I did work at Monash Health for um, 16 years. Most of that as an allied health director, so very strong background in um, working with allied health. But um, when I came to Hearth, PBS was new to me, and I've certainly learned a lot about it in the last two years, and it's a very important component to the work that we do with our clients. Um, so um, we will um, hear from Dr. Erin very shortly. So Erin has, um, has worked with us since the beginning and she consults with us regularly um, through Hearth and has been a great supporter. Um, and we um, do a lot of mutual work together. So Erin is a board certified behavior analyst and a senior lecturer at Monash University um, where she currently works in the education psychology and inclusive education academic community. Erin leads the Masters of Education and Applied Behavior Analysis Program. And of course, she's a very keen researcher. Um, one of her primary research interests involves exploring strategies for building the capacity of the workforce to better uh, support individuals with additional needs, um, especially young children and young people with behaviours of concern who are most at risk for exclusion and social isolation, which is one of the main reasons that the partnership with Hearth Allied Health is so mutually beneficial. Um, Hearth Allied Health are also dedicated to recruiting, upskilling and developing excellent PBS practitioners who are keen to learn and value opportunities like today uh, to listen and learn um, from some of the best minds in the PBS space and we pride ourselves on that. Um, so we are always recruiting all levels of practitioners. Um, uh, we currently have a senior team lead position um, that we're recruiting to in Melbourne as well as practitioners. Um, all our career opportunities are on our website. If anybody's interested in a conversation, um, you can approach Megan or I or email us after the event today. Um, so today the focus is on human rights and the role of PBS in seeking to reduce restrictive practices in the lives of our clients. So first of all, we will hear from Dr. Aaron, and then we will um, have Megan, um, Megan Phillips, our director. Um, for PBS um, and she's going to facilitate a discussion here um, and Dr Chad Bennett and Erin will be part of that as well and we'll have a Q&A session um, so if you've got ideas and things as um, the presentation goes on jot them down and um, you'll have the opportunity for questions. Um, I'll let Erin um, come and join us for the main presentation and um, Megan will introduce Chad when we get to the Q&A part. Thank Welcome. You. Hi everyone online, thank you so much for being here. Thank you everyone here in person today as well. Um, just checking the camera, it looks like you guys can all see me, so that's good. Um, there should be slides up, so Julian will help get those slides up in just a second. Um, but thank you to everyone at Hearth for your support and for inviting me to talk to everyone today. I really appreciate um, that opportunity. Um, I want to begin. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that same respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I would also like to acknowledge that there is still a lot of work to be done to explore how we can deliver educational and behavior support services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in ways that protect and uphold their human rights and in ways that are culturally safe and culturally responsive. So I hope that some of the conversations we have here today will spark some additional thoughts and uh, conversations around how we can include the voices and choices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in behavior support. I'd also like to acknowledge some people who have really shaped my thinking in this area. It truly has been a team effort in terms of um, the ideas that I'm gonna talk about today and the research that I've done in this area. So uh, Russell Fox, Pearl Subin, and Umesh Sharma um, from Monash University, as well as Dr. Jeff Potter and Matthew Spicer. Dr. Alinka Fisher from Flinders and Jeff Chan from the NDIS Quality and Safeguarding Commission. <clears throat> so I want to begin by introducing some context for today's presentation. It's really important to highlight that disability policy and legislation in Australia is underpinned by the Convention on the Rights of People with Disability, or 
the CRPD. The CRPD was drafted in 2006 and it identifies the rights of people with disability as well as the obligations of countries to protect and uphold those rights. And this document, this international treaty was significant because it was the very first to bring people with disability together from around the world and articulate their needs and concerns in one international treaty. I really like this description of the CRPD. The, con the convention follows decades of work by the United Nations to change attitudes and approaches to persons with disabilities. It takes to new heights the movement from viewing people with disabilities as objects of charity, medical treatment, and social protection to viewing people with disability as subjects with rights who are capable of claiming those rights and making decisions in their lives based on their free and informed consent. So the CRPD is kind of a complex document. It includes eight guiding principles and 50 articles, all of which are designed to promote, protect, and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms of people with disability. And something weird happened. Give me one second here. I'll let you do it, Julian, because mm -hmm. I'll probably and, and switch off teams. Like <laughs> yeah, slide. There we go. Sorry about that. I probably did something. Um, so many countries around the world have signed and ratified the CRPD, and these are shown in red and dark blue on this illustration. Signing means that the country expresses the intention to comply with the treaty. However, this expression is not binding. Countries who have ratified the CRPD have made a public and international commitment to be bound by the articles and principles outlined in the treaty. This is called ratification, and once countries officially ratify the document, they make a commitment to uphold the human rights of people with disability in policy, legislation, and other activities undertaken within that country. Um, so it's important to note that countries who have signed and ratified the CRPD, including Australia, um, have made that public commitment and therefore we all have an obligation to look at ways to protect and uphold the rights of people with disabilities in all aspects of social and political life including education employment health care and justice now the CRPD is important for several reasons. So historically, and now we're gonna talk more about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Historically, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have been removed from their families and placed in congregate care institutional settings where they've had really limited opportunities for choice and community inclusion. Individuals with intellectual and dis uh, developmental disabilities are also at a higher risk for experiencing discrimination, abuse, neglect, and exploitation, often due to their difficulties communicating. Some people with intellectual disabilities who display behaviors of concern may be at an increased risk for experiencing restrictive practices such as physical, chemical, or mechanical restraint. And finally, even today, mainstream service providers say that they struggle to um, consistently accommodate or support the needs of people with intellectual and developmental disability. So as a result of all of these factors, we think that the identification of strategies for upholding, protecting and upholding the rights of people with disability, particularly through the provision of positive behavior support, is a really, really important area that we need to be talking about and a really important area for future research. So what is a restrictive practice? Many of you probably already know this, but essentially, um, it's any intervention that we put in place 
that has the effect of reducing the rights of freedom and movement of a person with disability. And it may include physical, mechanical, or chemical restraint or seclusion. Despite recent government and policy initiatives designed to reduce the use of restrictive practices um, when supporting individuals with disability who display behaviors of concern, the use of restrictive practices does remain commonplace. And I think it's also important here to talk a little bit about what we mean when we use the term behaviors of concern. Behaviors of concern the definition is going to vary from person to person. And I think we need to look at behaviors of concern for who and in what context. We may adopt a definition that states that behaviors of concern are those behaviors that pose a safety risk or a risk to the health, safety, and well being of the person or to others. And they place a person at an increased risk of exclusion. But I think it's really important that we're mindful of the behaviors that we label as behaviors of concern and really understand the impact of those behaviors for the person and for others. But there's some evidence to suggest that in Australia, we're really, really struggling to effectively reduce the use of restrictive practices as part of programs designed to um, support people with challenging behavior. So people who have provided evidence as part of the recent Disability Royal Commission into the violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation of people with disability reported that there's limited data on the use of restrictive practices, but they felt that such practices continue to be widely used in Australian home, community, and educational settings, often in the absence of any therapeutic supports. So people have very recently raised these concerns. And in 2020, Richardson and colleagues published a longitudinal study to identify some of the factors that are associated with the long term use of restraint and restrictive practices in the state of Victoria. The authors looked at a sample of over a thousand people with intellectual disabilities who were experiencing restrictive practices at baseline. And three to five years later, they found that 870 or 74% of those people were still experiencing that restrictive practice without any systematic fading plan in place. That's three to five years later. And some of the factors that seem predictive of the longer term use of restrictive practices included the use of psychotropic medication having a diagnosis of autism or having communication difficulties. These were characteristics that seem to be associated with the longer term use of restrictive practices. And more recently, the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission has released some data on the number of um, you, the use of unauthorized restrictive practices, and they found more than half a million reports of an unauthorized use of a restrictive practice um, for just a six month period. So um, in those cases, the majority of restrictive practices that were reported involved the use of chemical or environmental restraint. So again, some more data really showing um, that these practices are used quite often. Now, Concerns have been raised that the use of restrictive practices or that restrictive practices are overused or misused and often used as the first step when managing behaviors of concern. And there's several, um, there are several problems with this. First of all, the use, the misuse or overuse of the practice can result in physical harm or psychological harm and in some cases even death. And the use of these practices can restrict a person's autonomy and freedom, and they present long term risks to a person's health and safety. So it's really important that we continue to look at ways to identify the conditions in which a restrictive practice may be used, it may be warranted, as well as the steps that we can take to reduce the use of restrictive practices over time. Often restrictive practices are used 
because people are anxious, are fearful of fading the practices. They don't have an alternative plan in place to support the person with their behavior should the behavior occur again or occur at a higher frequency or intensity. They often are not well versed in alternatives to restrictive practices. And even if they are familiar with positive behavior support, there are implementation challenges. Actually taking what's written in a behavior support plan and implementing it effectively in the person's daily life can be really, really challenging. But I think it's also important to note that the goal of the, NDI the NDIS Quality and Safeguarding Commission isn't to outlaw the use of restrictive practices. There are conditions in which the use of a restrictive practice may be needed. The goal of the commission with respect to behavior support is to oversee behavior support practitioners and implementing providers um, to make sure that they're building their capability in alternatives to the use of restrictive practices and also ensure that restrictive practices are being monitored and used correctly and safely. They're meant to provide resources and recommendations to practitioners, as well as providers, families, um, and others. They are tasked with reviewing monthly reports on the use of regulated restrictive practices and following up on incidents and handling complaints. So the Quality and Safeguarding Commission has a lot of functions. At this time, one of its main functions is to ensure that restrictive practices are not being misused or overused, used as the sole intervention component to support people with behaviors of concern. And a really important document to be familiar with in this space is the National Framework for Reducing and Eliminating the Use of Restrictive Practices um, in the Disability Sector. Now, the framework focuses on um, strategies and steps that I, I would say high level things that organizations and practitioners can do to reduce the use of restrictive practices. And it does so from a human rights angle. It does so from the point of view that human, um, the use of restrictive practices can in fact contravene the Convention on the Rights of People with Disability and um, their rights. <clears throat> So some of the high level principles outlined in the framework include um, the need for everybody to actually understand what the human rights of people with disability are and look for ways that they can uphold, protect and uphold those rights at all levels of service delivery. In such case, this uh, guide recommends that restrictive practices should only occur in limited and specific circumstances as a last resort, utilizing the least restrictive practice and for the shortest amount of time possible. It also recommends that we take a person-centered focus, placing the person with disability and their family at the center of decision-making. We should take a national approach. This is challenging as well. All states and territories should take a consistent approach to monitoring the use of restrictive practices and supporting the workforce to build capability in alternatives. We need data to make decisions about how well our practices are working. We need a focus on delivering quality outcomes. We need accountability through documentation and data collection collaboration between service providers, as well as raising awareness um, about the use of restrictive practices and their risks and alternatives. So again, these are very high level principles that can be tricky to translate into meaningful action in the work that we do every day. There's another consideration here, which is this idea of duty of care versus dignity of risk. Duty of care is essentially a legal term. It's the responsibility of service providers and practitioners um, to keep both the person with disability, staff, families, and others in the community safe. Duty of care does not mean that we take decision-making away from the person with disability and their families. We need to make sure we're not 
over protecting the person. We need to make sure that we're not slipping back into a charity model of disability in which we view ourselves as the experts and we know what's best for you and we are going to take care of you and protect you from yourself. We need to move beyond that way of thinking to one which views the person with disability as somebody who is capable of making decisions and has rights. Dignity of risk refers to the right of every person, including people with disabilities, to make choices and take risks in order to learn, grow, and have a better quality of life. So inherent with the idea of dignity of risk is the idea that experiences, life enriching experiences come with an element of risk, even when the best planning and support, um, which the best planning and support cannot entirely eliminate. Now, we often position duty of care and dignity of risk as binary. It's one or the other, you know, we need to figure out which side of the spectrum we're on, but in fact, it's a continuum. And these are very dynamic things that should influence our decision making. It can be challenging to balance duty of care and dignity of risk. What brings someone a good quality of life sometimes brings risk, but we need to allow them to experience those things if doing so doesn't put them or others in immediate risk of safety um, or serious injury or other safety concerns. So it's something we really need to think about. How do we incorporate these ideas of duty of care and dignity of risk into our decision making when providing behavior support services? And I think what's happened in a lot of ways in the disability sector is that organizations have moved too far to the duty of care side of the equation. And it's a very risk averse culture that we've created. Um, and so we tend to put in more restrictive practices to manage risk as a first option and as a first line of defense. Um, and in doing so are taking away choice opportunities for people with disabilities. So I think we need to carefully consider how the structures and systems within service provider organizations may actually be um, impinging on the rights of people with disability and how we can look from a structural perspective um, to take steps to um, allow people to make more of their own decisions. There's some research that has actually looked at, well, what can organizations do that actually helps reduce the use of restrictive practices? And I really like this study. It was a longitudinal study that used a multi-component organizational intervention to reduce the use of restrictive practices over time. This wasn't just the provision of positive behavior support to individual clients. This was an organizational approach. They did several things. First is that they looked at the impact of trauma on behavior. They looked at the impact of trauma on their staff. They looked at the things that were really challenging and were influencing the behavior of both um, participants and staff. And they infused a trauma-informed approach across the whole organization. They also identified their organizational values and articulated their values and how they want to support people, how they want to focus on quality of life and their value to reduce restrictions. They provided extensive staff training in alternatives to the use of restrictive practices, but they also had robust safety plans because one of the biggest barriers to fading the use of restrictive practices is that people don't feel safe anymore. So we can't start to have meaningful um, conversations about reducing restrictive practices until we can have meaningful and open conversations about safety. They also um, embedded frequent opportunities for communication between participants and staff, between staff and supervisors um, to facilitate debriefing and reflective practice following incidents. And finally, they took data. They just took data to facilitate database problem um, solving and actually were able to demonstrate um, the reductions in the use of uh, restrictive practices over time. So again, the point here is that research shows that the provision of positive behavior support plans alone 
is not likely to be effective for reducing, it can be, but long-term and from a bigger picture perspective, is not likely to be the most effective way to reduce restrictive practices. It requires a systemic organizational approach. And as well, under what conditions might you use a restrictive practice? So again, I'm not standing up here saying that restrictive practices should be outlawed, but I think that restrictive practices should be used in conjunction with a number of other things. So we've got a functional behavior assessment. We've come to an understanding of why this behavior is happening for the person. What function does this behavior serve? We have a plan that articulates alternative positive behavior support strategies that focus on teaching communication repertoires. It focuses on changing the environment around the person and um, it focuses on um, enhancing well being and quality of life. We include the person and their family in decision making and developing the support. We have systems to strengthen the capability of practitioners and support workers to implement alternative strategies. We have data collection systems in place. So we're doing all of these things that come with a PBS approach. And then perhaps there are some conditions in which, yes, we need to include a restrictive practice as part of that plan, but that's not our sole intervention. We don't even think of a restrictive practice as a therapeutic intervention. We think of it as a needed safety plan element, but we want to avoid even getting to that situation in the first place through our positive behavior support strategies. So I always like to talk about well, what do we mean when we say positive behavior support? Positive behavior support has now been endorsed by several government departments, including the NDIS, the Victorian Department of Education, as a safe and effective alternative to the use of restrictive practices when supporting people with behaviors of concern. And sometimes it's easy to think that PBS is but one intervention from a suite of interventions that we may implement to support a person. But I would encourage you to think about PBS not as an intervention, but as a framework, okay? It's underpinned by a conceptual model that views behaviors of concern as functional rather than symptomatic of an underlying deficiency diagnosis or mental health disorder. Behaviors of concern happen because they serve a purpose. And that is a, a communication purpose. It's a way the person is expressing their wants and needs. And when used as a process or a framework for supporting people with disability with behaviors of concern, it involves functional behavior assessment, a multi-component behavior support plan that focuses on changing the environment around the person and teaching new skills. It includes implementation support, monitoring, and database problem solving. And it includes a strong therapeutic relationship between the practitioner, team members, the family, and the person with disability. We're in it for a long haul. This is a long-term relationship. It's not a one-off report or a write and run away activity. <clears throat> so again, in PBS, we're focusing on using what we call a constructional approach, which is looking at what is a good life for this person? What brings this person joy? What is this person good at? Where are the areas where they have lagging skills and how can we build new skills to help this person participate in all sorts of great things in life? And how can we increase opportunities for this person to make choices, develop positive relationships with others, and participate in the world in a meaningful way? And in this approach, reductions in behaviors of concern are viewed as a side effect rather than as the main goal of the support that we provide. So again, it can be challenging to know how do we translate the what are eight principles and 50 articles in the CRPD into meaningful action in the work that we do as behavior support practitioners. So in 2022, we were provided with an opportunity to collaborate with the International Journal of Developmental Disabilities to prepare a special issue on um, a topic that we were interested in. So we wanted to use the opportunity to further explore what it means to deliver rights-based positive behavior support. So we all had a shared interest in PBS 
and we're particularly interested in exploring ways that we could deliver services that are consistent with what is expressed in the in the CRPD. So I'm very happy to let you know that this issue has now been published and all of the articles can be accessed for free woohoo! until the end of March. So you can scan scan the little barcode and that will take you right to the issue online. Um, so go ahead and, and check that out. I'll have Fiona circulate the slides after the presentation as well so you guys can have access to that later on. So we wanted to adopt a consistent definition of positive behavior support to guide this work. So we decided to use the definition of positive behavior support provided by Kincaid and colleagues in 2016, because we think this definition reflects the diverse application of PBS across a range of population settings and levels of implementation. So we like this definition because it maintains a commitment to the use of non-aversive and positive approaches that are respectful of a person's dignity and aims to in enhance a person's well-being and quality of life. This definition also recognizes the need for PBS to address larger systems issues that prevent people with disabilities from experiencing inclusion, participation, and community presence. So we feel that this definition of PBS might be best aligned to the human rights model of disability. So behavior support practitioners, which many of you probably are, are now responsible for delivering, developing and delivering positive behavior support plans that aim to reduce the use of restrictive practices. But we really need to learn more about what makes it challenging for you to do this and conversely what helps you what helps you in your work to do this so that's a um a research project that we undertook last year where we conducted a survey we um, had the survey filled out by 109 australian behavior support practitioners and we just had an open-ended question and we asked them to tell us what makes it challenging for you to reduce the use of restrictive practices in your work? And what helps you? What enables you to reduce the use of restrictive practices in your work? We got some really, really good data, which has then influenced my recommendations here. And again, you can access the article for free till the end of March. <laughs> so feel free to read it, download it, share it, all the good stuff. Um, so we got some really, really good data that we were able to use to inform a set of recommendations. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of the presentation this morning. So what can behavior support practitioners do in a really practical sense to start to move towards reducing the use of restrictive practices? So um, we first recommend as practitioners that we evaluate thoroughly evaluate the environment in which the person lives and learns as part of the provision of services. We don't wanna look at the behavior in isolation. Sometimes, I would actually change that now say often or most of the time, behaviors of concern are a very adaptive response to a very maladaptive environment. Sarah, did I say that in class last night? <laughs> So sometimes behaviors of concern, often behaviors of concern are a very adaptive response to a very maladaptive environment. Jeffrey Chan and colleagues wrote a paper for our special issue all about environments of concern. And maybe this is time to shift our language and start talking about environments of concern and treating environments of concern in our work as PBS practitioners. But we need to even zoom out more holistically. It could be that the person with disability and their families uh, their family is facing hardships in the, oh yes, I like the comment, yes, yes, thanks Danielle. It could be that the person with disability in their family is facing hardships in the areas of safety, housing, relationships, or other lifestyle areas. Maybe our job isn't to deliver PBS plans, but maybe our job is then to connect the person with other social services and supports that can help them with these aspects of their life. So in, in that sense, do we need to think about ourselves as connectors? Healthy and resilient families and care teams may be better positioned to fully participate in the behavior support process. So we also need to recognize our own scope of competence when doing this work. 
and make recommendations to other professionals when the needs of the person may fall outside our scope of competence. We also recommend that practitioners focus on building a strong therapeutic alliance with the person with disability and their family, as well as members of the care team. So a therapeutic alliance is a relationship between a practitioner and client in which the practitioner views the participant, their family members as an active partner and equal in the planning process. Research has actually shown that a therapeutic alliance is a very important part of family centered care and can improve outcomes. <clears throat> In the provision of positive behavior support, we might develop a strong therapeutic alliance by spending time with the person. Just spend time, get to know the person, get to know the family, listen, listen a lot before we tell. We also can gather information from the family care team or others about the types of practices that they've used before. What are they doing now? What did they stop doing and why? Why did they abandon certain things? We don't wanna do things that families and individuals don't find appropriate or acceptable within their context. We also need to understand how the use of certain restrictive practices actually fulfill an immediate need for families, right? We need to take a function based approach to understanding why restrictive practices are used rather than just saying that people are scared. Or I think we titled our, our paper, stakeholders are almost always resistant. And then in the discussion of our paper, we said this is illustrative of the fundamental attribution error which is our tendency to chase the reasons for behavior inside of other people. But for ourselves, we tend to look externally. When supporting families who are having a hard time or who are using restrictive practices, we need to understand why. Why are the families using it? How does the use of this practice fulfill a need for the family? And during this time of getting to know, we can learn about what's been previously done, the degree to which previous strategies were successful, or the degree to which previous strategies may have been abandoned and why. We recommend that practitioners engage in person-centered planning with the person and their family. So this involves an individualized, active, and collaborative approach to identify first valued outcomes. What are we aiming for? What's the dream? What's the vision? And then how do we work backwards to put in short, medium and longer term supports to help you achieve the dream? Again, it's an individualized and active approach to planning, which really centers the voices and choices of the person with disability and their families and, and support network. It can be used at all phases of intervention planning. And that could provide a forum for discussion about why restrictive practices are being used. What are people's fears and concerns about reducing these practices? And how can we co-generate ideas about alternatives to the use of restrictive practices? Fiona, how am I doing on time? Good? Okay. We recommend that practitioners and families advocate for time to support implementation. I think we're facing a bit of a structural challenge with the way that NDIS funded supports are currently delivered, where it's great that funding goes directly to families and families have choice and control. But how do we support ongoing teaming, coaching and collaboration when funding goes to individuals and not service provider organizations in any sense? Like, I don't know what the solution is, but like this is a challenge <laughs> and we need to think more about how we can support all of these other activities that sit around the development of a PBS plan, all of the systems that are what makes PBS successful. Again, I reiterate that PBS is not simply a plan. It's a framework that includes implementation support, monitored, monitoring of valued client outcomes over time, and database problem solving. These are critical components of PBS, but can be challenging to implement in the real world. So this is another area where we need to look more at what can be done. And finally, we need to encourage accurate reporting of the use of restrictive practices. We need to have these 
numbers. We need to have this data to be able to make decisions about how well what we're doing is working and what isn't working so well and may need to be changed. So again, practitioners noted that the collection and analysis of data was really challenging either because they didn't have the data or um, didn't have the time within their workload to be able to look at these data. Um, and when I get to things that that regulatory agencies could do. I think regular regulatory agencies have a big role to play in helping facilitate database problem solving in the sector. So what can service provider organizations do? We've looked at individual practitioners, but what can service provider organizations do? <clears throat> what did I say they could do? Sorry, skipped ahead too far. There we go. So again, more systemic strategies beyond the provision of individualized positive behavior support plans are needed to reduce the use of restrictive practices. So organizations should look for ways to build systems that support successful implementation. So to support systems that facilitate things like person-centered planning, implementation coaching, data collection and analysis, and the provision of time and resources for training um, and for collaboration. So one start for service provider organizations may be to work collaboratively with government and regulatory agencies to look at developing some guidelines and checklists for assessing the degree to which these um, systems and structures exist within their organization and looking at ways to implement systems and structures that are found to be missing. As well, given the variability of the behavior support practitioner workforce, I think service provider organizations should seek to establish tiered models in which more junior practitioners have the opportunity to work directly under supervision of more senior practitioners. And there's protected time within the job for reflective supervision and debriefing. That's a really critical component to build a strong, stable and resilient workforce. We also need organizational systems to facilitate data collection and database problem solving. This might be accomplished in a number of different ways. We might be able to look at developing more standardized methods of reporting on the use of restrictive practices to make it easier how we could do that across an organization. We also need to make sure that people aren't reprimanded or punished or shamed for reporting the use of restrictive practices. Amen. If people are fearful of reporting because they're fearful of the consequences of accurate reporting, we are never going to get accurate data. This might result in what looks to be a temporary increase in the use of restrictive practices. And I say this is in fact a desirable thing because at least we're encouraging accurate reporting and we can establish an accurate baseline from which to work moving forward. And we also can look at the establishment of committees, peer review committees within individual service provider organizations that take time to meet and review data. Nobody should be going it alone. It's so helpful to have time to work in teams, to look at data and to problem solve. And these peer review committees might also include relationships with external practitioners, researchers, and people with lived experience of disability and their families. So we can ensure that all voices and perspectives are included. Now there's a really nice document out of the US that I think needs to be kind of updated and contextualized in Australia. Um, it's called the six core strategies for reducing seclusion and restraint. We might use the term restrictive practices and it's a planning tool and it covers six what they identify as six core strategies, which involves leadership that takes a positive and proactive approach towards organizational change, the use of data to inform practice, workforce development, the use of restraint and seclusion prevention tools. So those are things like positive behavior support plans and um, staff training and um, upskilling in the use of alternatives to the use of restrictive practices, uh, risk assessment, um, trauma-informed care, um, documents and policies that are easy read and non-discriminatory, 
the inclusion of people with disabilities and their families in organizational decision making, and finally debriefing and reflective practice. So this document actually does provide a checklist that service provider organizations can use as a start point um, to look at the systems that they might implement within their own organization. And finally, what can regula regulators, so when I say regulators, I mean like the Quality and Safeguarding Commission, <laughs> or it could be other government organizations, but what can regulators do to help? People still don't understand what constitutes a restrictive practice. There's still challenges around definitions. And some people say, well, it'd be great, just give us a list. But there's, it's not possible to give a list because restrictive practice, the way it's used, the context depends on whether or not something counts as a restrictive practice. It's important to note, again, that restrictive practices are not defined based on what they look like but rather by the way the practice is used. So a, a psychotropic medication might be a restrictive practice in some contexts, but not in others. So it could be that clear examples and non-examples and different scenarios of what counts as a restrictive practice could be helpful. It could also be that decision-making trees are more um, like video examples of talking through scenarios and how to problem solve if something is or is not a restrictive practice based on contextual variables would be really important. <clears throat> kind of building on that idea, I think um, there's a document called the NDIS's Regulated Restrictive Practices Guide, which actually has some decision trees that can help practitioners work through um, the identification of restrictive practices. But I think these could be made available as single page PDFs. These are just really practical things. Single page PDFs are video examples of people working through the decision trees to um, show how their use looks in practice. These sorts of resources could be really helpful for um, helping people identify a restrictive practice and and communicate with families or others about restrictive practices. Many people with disabilities who have behaviors of concern um, and who experience restrictive practices may need long-term support. Long-term support likely involves ongoing coaching, ongoing therapeutic alliance, ongoing person-centered planning, and ongoing data collection and analysis. And these types of activities occur after the plan is written. So it's critical that appropriate funding is allocated to allow for these activities to occur. And I think we all have a role to play in advocating, continue to advocate for how we, um, how much funding, but how we use the funding. You know, the funding should be spent on these implementation activities as much as possible. Again, we need more data. We talked about this already, but I think regulatory agencies have a big role to play in facilitating accurate reporting and reinforcing and welcoming accurate reporting rather than reporting be seen as you're doing something wrong and you might get in trouble. And I think one way that service providers and regulatory agencies could do this is let's all work together. Let's identify what are the challenges to data collection and reporting. Let's come up together with a list of those barriers and then let's work together to come up with strategies to overcome those barriers. Again, we need to have these really open conversations to be able to move forward instead of not wanting to talk about it because the use of restrictive practices is a difficult or touchy subject. Now, practitioners reported a lot of confusion about how to collaborate effectively with other professionals, particularly when working with medical professionals who prescribe psychotropic medication. Prescribing medication for any purpose is beyond the scope of practice for a behavior support practitioner, but it now seems as though the responsibility for authorizing and monitoring the use of restrictive practices sit squarely with the practitioner. This is weird. Behavior support practitioners may also have limited influence over medical professionals who are the appropriate qualified, appropriately qualified professionals to authorize, prescribe, and oversee the use of medication. So we need a national strategy aimed at improving the identification, monitoring, and reduction of chemical restraint in particular. And 
Such a strategy might be undertaken in collaboration between the Quality and Safeguarding Commission, the um, state and territory governments, and uh, peak medical professional bodies like the RACGP. So this is another big one where there's a lot of work to do to improve um, practice and facilitate collaboration. And I'll just end with a few tips on well, what strategies can we use to, I might have gone one too forward, what strategies can we use to actually uphold the rights of our clients in practical ways? So again, I advocate for adopting a person-centered planning approach, and there's some really great resources out of the UK, the Challenging Behavior Foundation in the UK, about ways that we can use a person-centered planning approach. But we want to work in partnership with the person with disability and their families through all phases, rather than viewing us as the experts who are going to come in and tell you what to do. And so we want to look at ways that we can facilitate ongoing opportunities for the person to make choices, use a supportive decision making framework, and ultimately put them in touch with other informal and more naturalistic supports to build their network so that we can start to fade out. We don't want to be the sole person that they rely on. We want to build their network of other supports. We want to work ourselves out of a job. I also think practitioners need to take a more holistic and trauma informed approach to the delivery of PBS. We can't just look at the behavior in isolation, but we need to look at the person's needs in multiple areas such as medical, educational, social relationships. We need to look at connecting them with supports to ensure their medical needs are being addressed. They have access to education and they have access to do fun things in life that we all get to do. <clears throat> we need to make sure we're communicating with people with disability and their families in ways that they can understand. We need to really, really focus on plain explanations and easy to understand language. And this includes explaining the purpose and goals and outcomes of our assessment and behavior support strategies. We might use visuals or other augmentative forms of communication to increase understanding. We need to frequently take the time to listen as well. We need to ask a lot of questions and take time to listen to the needs of the person and their family. So we should work again with the person and their family to set goals, implement behavior support strategies, and do other activities that ultimately lead to improved quality of life and well-being as a core outcome um, or focus of the work that we do. We need better tools to assess things like quality of life and well-being because sometimes showing that we can change behavior on a graph doesn't tell the whole story. So we need to really elevate the lived experience behind the data as part of our delivery of services and find new ways to tell that story so people understand what the experience was like for the person and their family. And finally, I think that service provider organizations and all of us who work in this space need to make a commitment to understanding, respecting, and upholding the rights of people with disability and to be very explicit in our organizational policies and procedures about the specific things that we will do to uphold the rights of participants and their families that are coming to us for services. These policies and procedures should be transparent and available to everyone easily and should be reviewed regularly and should include input from people with disabilities and their families. <clears throat> so, what are we doing now? Well, I'm trying to scratch out something that I call a rights-based model of positive behavior support. And I'm writing a paper on this right now. So you're the first to hear about it. So what is a rights-based model of positive behavior support? Believe it or not, within the PBS literature, there is very little discussion of human rights, and this is a problem. I'm proposing a rights-based model of positive behavior support that will encourage and support practitioners to do the activities listed here. How can we respect the person and their decisions? How do we include the person in the planning, delivery, and evaluation of their own supports? 
how do we get to know the person and really take the time to listen and learn about their needs? What does it mean to use a holistic approach or a social ecological approach when supporting people with behaviors of concern? What do we need to do to tell and teach others about the human rights of people with disability? And how do we support the person to live their best life? So I hope to sketch out this model more in the coming weeks, months, days, whatever, years, years. Um, and I would love any feedback um, from any of you on that and what could be missing. So where do we go from here? I don't know. I mean, there's so much we could do. <laughs> I think in the panel discussion, we'll have more time um, to talk about you know, future directions. Um, and where we go from here, but I would love to find more ways to collaborate with practitioners and really understand the experiences of, you know, practitioners and the work that you do and what's worked well for you and what's been challenging um, to so we can continue to develop resources, materials, guidelines, things that will really help you address um, challenges in practice. That's like really where I sit in terms of research. It's that translation piece. Like how do we get good stuff happening on the ground and good information into the hands of all of you as practitioners? So when we have our panel discussion shortly, it'd be great to hear more from all of you. All of you out there too in online world um, about what what you think we can do because you're more of I'm, honestly you're the experts in terms of like what this is like on the ground so i hope this presentation was helpful and sparked some food for thought and i'm happy to take any questions at any point in time and i've included some references at the end in case you're looking for some um of the documents that I referred to in the in the presentation. So that is it for me. Thank you all so much for listening and thank you all online. And I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> oh good. Well, thank you um, to Erin um, and for everybody for um, participating. And there's lots of chat going on and I think some questions formulating um, and some of the challenges that are being highlighted um, um, in receipt of that information. Um, and some of us attended um, Dr. Erin's um, launch of the International Journal. Um, was that two weeks ago? Two weeks ago? It was like the very end of January. Recently, recently. We'll say recently. Um, um, where they, we had the opportunity to hear from the authors of those um, different um, topics um, and the, the journal. Um, we will get the um, QR code out with the materials that we send out after today's presentation as well. So if you didn't catch it today, you can catch it whenever we send out the, um, the documents afterwards. Um, so in the program, um, we're just going to have a short comfort break here. Um, at the Theatrette um, for a quick coffee and stretch your legs. And we'll be back in approximately 15 minutes. So um, have an online break and we will be back with you very, very shortly. Thank you. Welcome back from the break, everyone here in the Theatrette and everybody online. Um, my name is Nathan Phillips. I'm Director of Positive Behaviour Support here at Heart. Um, I'd like to introduce to everybody, um, we've all got to know Dr. Erin. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Chad Bennett. Chad is a clinical director and consultant psychiatrist at the Victorian Field Disability Service, or BDDS as commonly known, which is part of Victoria's mental health centre and aims to promote equitable access to mental health care for people with dual disability, uh, that includes felt mental disability, intellectual disability and mental health problems. Other half team members are here today. We have Sean and Sharon here in the audience and Carolyn and Amber online. So I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Erin. Um, has, has anyone in the audience got any questions of Erin of from her presentation? Okay. <coughs> Um, about 74% of the factors for longitudinal uh, use of the district practices. Yeah. The individuals who fell outside of the 74% that were still using district practices, was there any outlines of protective factors or what they saw that really supported 
Yeah, so the question, I'm not sure if people online could hear, but the question was around the study that I cited in my presentation around, the, um, it was Richardson 2020, where they did a longitudinal study of um, people who were experiencing restrictive practices and um, over time to see the degree to which those restrictive practices were faded. And for people, so the findings of that study were that after three to five years, 75% of the people who are experiencing restrictive practices at baseline, we're still experiencing restrict, restrictive practices three to five years later. So only a quarter were able to um, save and eliminate the use of the restrictive practice. And so some of the variables that they found as predictive for the use of long-term restrictive practices were um, uh, the prescribed psychotropic medication, having a diagnosis of autism, and having a communication difficulty. So the question is, were there, like what facilitated the reduction for the other 25% where they were able to fade? Um, and I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> I would have to go back and look at the paper and I'm not even sure if the authors highlighted that aspect. Um, but, um, you know, I think that in terms of like general protective factors or things that can facilitate the reduction of restrictive practices, it would be interesting to see the degree to which what I talked about today actually re results in those sorts of outcomes. Because a lot of what I'm talking about is sort of, I would say, evidence informed. I'm making recommendations based on research findings and based on my clinical experience and based on survey studies. But we actually don't have those longitudinal studies, by and large, that show how doing what I recommended does produce reductions in restrictive practices. Like, there's actually very little research that we can point to that demonstrates that. There are like one or two studies, like Craig and Sanders, who I also cited today, that show that multi-component organizational reform package did lead to a reduction, not an elimination for every individual, but a reduction in the use of um, restrictive practices. So I think it's a it's an empirical question. Like there's so much more research to do to evaluate the long term effects of the provision of PBS and you know how we might implement and evaluate these sorts of multi component organizational packages over time. So it's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Yeah. Well, we will see about that. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. I forgot to mention earlier uh, that Naomi Anderson, who is a lawyer with Bill and Andrew Legal Services, is an apology today. She's had to be in court with one of her clients. Um, I did introduce myself. Um, so my name's Megan. I started as a mental retardation nurse back in the days of the institutions around Melbourne, Janefield and Kingsbury, when they started to phase out MRNs because we cost them too much. I left and went and started psychology and have been a psychologist ever since. I've um, so, yeah, still work in and out of disability, but also the correctional system, both with mainstream and disability offenders, and spent time working with the department in that this team has evolved prior to in the EIS coming in. Has anyone else got another question that they'd like to ask? Yeah. Justin. Uh, it's for Erin Moore. Chad, uh, who does this well around the world? So where are the pockets of excellence that we can learn from? And where, I guess, where does Australia sit in the maturity uh, relative to that uh, uh, expertise? Yeah, I think in terms of where we can look for examples of good practice, I think this is an emerging area around the world. I wouldn't say that there is a specific place or country that is just a model example of how to do this work well. Um, there are some really good things happening in the UK, um, which visiting the website of BUILD or the Challenging Behaviour Association in the UK, they seem to put, a get, put together teams and hubs and resources that can facilitate some of what I'm talking about um, a bit better than um, other countries have done. Um, so I think that the UK probably has some examples in terms of individual service provider organizations. Um, I can't, 
I can't really think of like a service provider organization. I can definitely think of some providers <laughs> in the United States that have really integrated systems for data collection and data analysis, um, incorporating peer review committees. So I do think there's some centers and programs in the United States um, that can be looked at um, that provide services to kids with really high support needs um, of how to do things like data collection and data um, based decision making. I do think that there are in the United States, there are other like laws, for example, um, particularly in educational context about the use of restrictive practices and how those have to be reported. So there's like, it seems like there's much more defined parameters around how to report and how often to report and um, who has access to those data and how the data can be used for decision making. Um, so in terms of where to look, I would say probably the United States and the UK would have some examples. But again, they're across the PBS sector as a whole. If I think of uh, publications research in the area of PBS, there aren't really research papers that have really articulated what a rights-based approach means. So I think Australia has the potential to be a real leader in this space and produce some of the most cutting edge innovative research and in what it means to deliver a human rights based approach. Um, the United States has not ratified the CRPD. So the United States has not yet made that public commitment to uphold the rights of people with disability in all aspects of life. They've signed it, but ratification is taking that one step further that you're going to underpin your laws, your disability policy and legislation by that human rights model. So I honestly think Australia has a real opportunity in the fact that we have some other you know, researchers, clinicians, people are learning more about this and people want to incorporate this into their practice, that there's a lot of opportunity here to emerge as world leaders in this space. Chad, I'm wondering if you could talk about um, how VDDS um, co-works in this space with some um, behavior support, um, and other aspects of the disability system. So, that, Chad, some people online are having a little bit of um, difficulty hearing, so okay. can you just speak up a little bit? Okay. <laughs> I'd appreciate it. Sure. I might give a very short answer to, to, to Justin's question. And the short version would be Holland, the UK, and the States. But that's not saying very much. I think it's about well, what's interesting about what are the things that make the difference. So uh, this is partly from, a, I guess, a, a, a medical perspective. So in Holland, one of the things they've got is certainly uh, in, in a medical context, they have training in uh, disability medicine. Um, so, you, you know, and I've often thought kind of like I can do the, the mental health bit. And actually, in the UK, that would include doing some of the neurology. So you would treat people with epilepsy, for example, because a lot of people with epilepsy as well. And then there's that kind of GP role, so doing vaccinations, basic physical health care. And I think about combining those three roles, and then as a doctor, I think you can offer a much better service to people with intellectual disabilities because it covers a broad range of kind of medical needs. So that's. And the other things I think the Dutch do that is interesting, and I don't know much about it, but I'd like to go and visit it, is they've actually created uh, small villages where just people with intellectual disabilities live and, and, and support staff kind of go in rather than, so it's a different kind of community model, I suppose. Um, in the UK, I think what they do well is the delivery of disability services and health services is much more integrated in the sense it's joint funded in certain areas. So you've actually got disability and health both putting into a pool of money to fund both behaviour support practitioners, uh, case managers, support coordinators and doctors. So everyone kind of works together and there's a kind of joint accountability and you can work together as a team. There's also a lot of allied health in those kind of teams. So you can access speech therapy, um, social work, uh, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, all within the one team without having to kind of go to someone and get the funding to go and then get that kind of service, if that makes sense. It's a much more integrated model. And then the other one, and again, I'm not visited this, but I've always thought this was kind of interesting. There are models, I think, I think we all recognize 
within mental health, and it seems to be whatever the disorder, there's always going to be a, a, a hard core of people that are difficult to look after. Mm -hmm. And in some states in uh, America, they've recognised this, and they have these models where, and I've always thought this is interesting, you probably won't like this, but they actually pay the direct care staff more than the visiting consultants and psychologists, mm -hmm. because they recognise actually that's where the hard work happens. Mm -hmm. These are the people who have got to implement these recommendations, and these are the people getting assaulted. And you want them to stay in their, their jobs. And what you see, particularly in Australia, and I think also the UK, is that this hard group of people, you actually get this constant movement of staff, which exacerbates their behaviour. So we, we, we did a study once where we wanted to interview people who had known the person for longer than six months, and a third of the time had to be excluded because no one had known them for longer than six months, which I think is just extraordinary. No one's known, so they had no friendships, no long-term relationships whatsoever. And then you wonder, well, why do they behave like this? Um, and so I, I think there's those systemic issues in, in the different countries. And the other thing I'll quickly add, the other thing in, in, in the UK is in, um, people may not like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Never stopped me before. So like in, in, in Australia, what we have is for a group of people with um, mental health problems and offending behaviour, we've got a hospital called Thomas Emily Hospital which is where people can go for secure care, if that makes sense. And they've got models like that in the UK for people with intellectual disability. So there's a group of people with an intellectual disability that are very difficult to look after due to the degree of, if you like, um, a violent behaviour that they can present with. And uh, I think unless you create an environment in which the staff can feel safe in working with these people, this group of people, you're not going to get anywhere. So there's a couple of models in the UK, one in Northampton and one at Brampton Hospital, where people with really difficult behaviours um, are looked after. And I don't think there's the equivalent in, in Victoria. And so one of the things we see is a lot of people take into the emergency department, though they don't have a mental health problem, and they just go back to the house. There's kind of no avenue for them to kind of follow. And so I do think that the justice systems need to make some kind of response to, to that. Um, and in answer to your question, going back to that, about how does the Victorian dual disability work with this? Well, we, we, we don't specifically, is the simple answer. So we kind of get some funding to work within the disability sector. Um, so we're happy to speak to anyone on the phone and, and, and talk through cases. We see it's complicated in the sense that we were funded by disability. Disability no longer exists. We still get the money, but no one's actually told us what to do with it. And it's not like we can go on holiday to Europe. So. <laughs> We're just kind of spending it on people at high clinical need where we think they will benefit from a, a, a mental health assessment. And sometimes that means working with this, but it's really a clinically based kind of decision. But we're always happy to um, speak to anyone on the phone if needed. It's like a relay, isn't it? Thank you, Joe. We have enough. Any questions online? Just want to check? Yeah, we'll just want to Another question to the audience. Um, look, I was just going to ask quickly because I know this is a struggle for many provided in regards to the Victorian Bill because the lady said it's that you have to often give it as an error mental health to get a poor assessment of someone with um, higher needs and complex sort of um, behaviours to be able to actually put in a support plan. Uh, I know at the moment you have the specialist behavioural practitioner that's sort of coming through, but they have rare find, like, <laughs> with as many providers and many funds coming through in it. But is there any way that we can work around that in it, just within the disability space without having this integrated with an area mental health? We're happy to take referrals from anyone. I guess how far we can progress that referral yeah. depends on who's involved in, in, in the person's care, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, we will, for example, um, we do get a, a lot of referrals from support uh, coordinators and behaviour practitioners. And as long as there's someone we can work with and as a high clinical need, we can do assessments on, on that group as well. But we're just a bit more limited in our capacity to provide that kind of service. So we, we tend to limit it to the more kind of um, uh, uh, significant or severe kind of um, problems. Okay. Do we have a database on like people, like in other sort of 
So it would be like you down at the, I guess, the higher tertiary end side of things, have like a medium sort of service that tends to offer that speciality. Is that like you from the yes or see it or that you know? There is the, I don't know if people have heard of this, the Centre for Developmental Disability Health Victoria, um, and they're primarily funded to work with GPs around health issues. They used to have um, a, a lot of mental health expertise, but um, they, they no longer do, so it's really, it's, it's just more around GP kind of advice rather than mental health kind of advice. But they're, they're funded to, to support um, GPs. Um, rather than um, behaviour support practitioners, but they will, I'm sure, offer advice. And then that's probably a question for, for anyone that has a perspective. What, what impact has COVID had? Uh, what have you seen with COVID and post? Uh, in relation to restrictive practices. In relation to restrictive practices, I think we all were subject to restrictive practices, actually. <laughs> 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 <I understand. Yeah. laughs> um, it was kind of interesting because we, we thought it would make things a lot worse. There was a group of people, actually, it, it made it better because it took the demands off them. They weren't forced to do things that they didn't like and go to these kind of day centres and interact with people that they didn't really get on with. And that group got, got better. And then there was another group who I think were bored and frustrated um, and, and got worse. It was, it was kind of, um, it was both good and bad in, in, in kind of, I guess, disability kind of world of what we saw. Yeah, I think COVID, COVID imposed restrictions that were um, like never before for all of us. And that had really different impacts for really different people. Um, some people really thrived having reduced demands and more chill lifestyle. And um, that was actually really good for them. Whereas other people really struggled not understanding why they couldn't leave the house and go out and visit people in the community and have people over. And I would say probably for the majority of people, it was associated with um, uh, it being a really tough time. And probably, I don't have data on um, the use of restrictive practices during COVID, but probably they may have been a bit worse. Um, but I also think that it offered new opportunities to explore telehealth and teleconsultation and how we can get services to people in the future, maybe who are in parts of Australia where there's just no access to services. So I think being able to innovate in um, how we reach people in remote and rural parts of the country where they often have nothing, COVID sparked some new um, innovations in that space, which I hope carry forward. <laughs> we do have an online question, which I'll answer this one also. Um, we wrote a lot of social stories during COVID, explaining the rules, explaining why they are influence, explaining what is COVID. Um, so we were similar to Chad, we saw a lot of people who coped better in that environment because they didn't have that pressure of going to the day program with behaviour anyway, um, having to interact with people. The, the other thing we saw in terms of restricted practice was that Organisations that had um, SDA accommodation also had their own rules on top of the COVID rules. So some of them had rules whereby no one was allowed in. Um, and as a behaviour support practitioner, that was difficult. So I, yeah, I believed it was more restrictive and there was a lot of discussions going on around this. Is it a staff and client safety discussion? Is it a restrictive practice discussion? Um, there were certainly some very heated uh, conversations that were happening at the time. Thank you. And this is a question um, from online from Jessica High. Uh, what resources can you recommend for practitioners to implement the framework? There seems to be lots of information regarding what needs to be done in practice, but not how. Outside of community of practice sessions, where can we access practical techniques? Um, so, my for 
framework are we talking about? I think, are we talking about the PBS I would framework? I will present the PBS. Yeah. OK, so where can we access resources? So the good news is that there's a really big piece of work that's underway that is going to be made public very soon um, that specifically um, talks about supported decision making. So there's a lot of emphasis on supported decision making in PBS or ways to um, support a person to make their own choices um, and play a more active role in the design and delivery of their own behavior support plan. And so um, that is a resource, like a suite of resources that should be coming out through the NDIS Quality and Safeguarding Commission in the next couple of months. Um, as I mentioned, the Challenging Behavior Foundation in the is that what it's called? Challenging Behavior Foundation in the UK um, has a lot of resources that are things like um, implementation checklists, uh, visual supports, um, you know, guides that can help support implementation. Um, there are some free online learning opportunities. Um, doing a Google search can help identify where they are. But for example, through Latrobe, they have a, a short course that's completely free. It's a series of six modules, I think, on supported decision making specifically, um, which is really a great kind of start point to talk about implementation. I do think one area that is really kind of missing is um, how to improve implementation coaching. What can we do to help others implement our recommendations and sustain successful implementation? Um, that's kind of where the magic happens and that's where people find it to be really, really challenging. Um, and I think we need more resources. We almost need a whole model of what does effective implementation coaching and support look like with a whole suite of resources to sit around um, that particular topic area. There's a book that I really like called Supporting Successful Implementation. <laughs> and it's by um, the Collier Meek and Sinetti. It's a school-based consultation guidebook, but I think it has um, applicability in disability um, services as well. And they provide a lot of practical checklists and implementation support um, for that aspect of it. Um, so hopefully that helps answer your question, but I agree with you. And I think a big piece of work right now is around the development of more of those resources um, that can support um, translating what we're talking about into practice every day. Would you add anything to that? Presentation? Okay. Yes, question. I'm really interested, I come from a mental health background and started in this girl in London. So I'm really interested in, um, as a social worker, if we're not responsible for monitoring the restrictive where do we draw the line with where our medication is therapeutic and where it's a restrictive practice? Very simple. Ask the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think it's bizarre, and I was kind of almost going to ask Erin this question. So this is an issue in, in, in mental health, and I think also in disability. I think the very fact that you've got a disability act that permits restrictive practices, including the, the prescription medication, just to people with a disability, is in itself discriminatory. Um, because you or I couldn't be subject to those uh, restrictions because we don't have a disability. And there's a debate in mental health at the moment about whether the, having a mental health act is discriminatory, because again, you can only uh, uh, provide involuntary treatment to someone who's got a mental illness, if that makes sense. Um, and then you've got this whole issue of, I mean, there's a huge issue around uh, 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 prescription of medication to people with intellectual disability. 
Um, and I think, unfortunately, I think the, the NDIS has bitten off a bit more than it can chew in the sense that it's picked this up even though it has no jurisdiction or expertise over the prescription of medication. So all you can do is go to a doctor and get them to fill in a form, and doctors hate it. Um, because as a doctor, you only get paid for face-to-face -face contact. And at the moment, GPs are getting paid about, once they've taken all their overheads into account, they're only getting paid about $40, $50 an hour. Um, and then, you know, they get all these requests to fill in these kind of forms that they don't get paid for. Um, and the NDIS won't pay for that because the NDIS doesn't pay for a kind of medical services. So it, it, it's interesting, I'll just kind of throw this out there. In, in Tasmania, they recently, the Human Rights Commissioner recently came up with this kind of um, uh, view that anyone who has been treated with, for particularly psychotropic medication, anyone who's receiving treatment and is unable to consent for a mental health condition, irrespective of what that was, this should be done under the Mental Health Act. Um, and, and I think you get much tighter uh, supervision because it's then reviewed by a lawyer, uh, a psychiatrist and a member of the public as to is this treatment appropriate. Whereas you've got um, various mechanisms in Victoria such as guardianship, so it might be a family member providing consent or a guardian or and you get the NDIS trying to oversee it but they actually they, they don't know, they don't have any doctors that can say yes this is a restricted practice. And in fact, doctors don't prescribe for restricted practice in the first place. So it's a bit like playing rugby with a football. Mm -hmm. You ask the doctor, no, I'm, I'm prescribing for therapeutic reasons. Right. So it's a completely different framework for thinking about that kind of problem. So it just doesn't translate very well from a disability field into a kind of mental health field. But I think that the failure to understand these issues that are conceptual and policy and legislative issue put you in this kind of awkward position of kind of like, well, what what on earth do we do with this kind of stuff? And I think one, I'll say one more thing. I think one thing that could be really helpful here is if we establish, like what you mentioned in TASI, if we establish peer review committees or human rights committees more widely where it's an interprofessional group that comes together, and that could include medical professionals, social workers, behavior support practitioners, allied health, people with disability, whatever. People come together and they review the cases under which these things are being used. And they um, are able to better answer that question. Um, and there's more, it's a, a supportive type of forum where they can problem solve. Um, how often it's being used, the conditions under which it's being used, what other supports are being put in place, what other um, supports is this person accessing, still with the goal being, well, hopefully we can look at reducing this medication over time. But for some people being on some medications, they might be on for their lifetime because that medication is having a therapeutic benefit. So they're really hard decisions to make. And I think what's tricky is now, there's some expectation that the behavior support practitioner be sort of central in making those decisions, but I feel that that's inappropriate because a behavior support practitioner is not a medical practitioner with that understanding and knowledge within their scope of practice. So that's where I think there's a lot of work to be done um, to address that issue. Thank you. I agree, I agree. <laughs> um, I think in the middle, from my experience, um, the medical sector, the definition of restrictive practice when it comes to med medicine is very different to, to ours. So yes, it's a lot of work to be done. Um, something that I've done in my local area was joining the, you know, the uh, local psychiatrists in the area to talk about our differing definitions of, of restrictive practice and, and what it means for us working in the disability system to help them understand why we're demanding they fill in these bits of paper all the time and how we can improve our form. Um, I have another point that's coming. I'll say one more thing, maybe I'll come back to you. <clears throat> I'm working with the Department of um, Fairness, Families and Housing here in Victoria, DFFH. Um, on a sort of small scale pilot project where we are looking at um, collaborate, like a collaborative teaming approach to uh, reviewing the use of psychotropic medication and developing phase.
not sort of, we're going to go in there and we're going to try to get rid of the use of psychotropic medication, but rather it's a way to um, start to use some common language and understanding how the medication is being used across GP prescribing um, GPs or medical professionals, um, support workers, families, and the individual with disability, and then do more collaborative teaming. Um, to look at ways to evaluate the effectiveness of that medication and towards reducing it. I think, you know, it's going to be challenging to execute the project and get all of these key players around the table together, given um, how it feels like people are very siloed and that they don't have the time <laughs> to commit to these types of collaborations. But if we can sort of do a small scale pilot and see well, what is this experience and a pharmacist. There's going to be a, a, a pharmacist who's going to um, be sort of um, the main coordinator of all of these moving parts. But one thing that's particularly important to look at in this space is the use of polypharmacy or prescribing multiple medications and often by many different doctors. And are we actually prescribing in such a way that's increasing the person's risk? Um, for side effects or their safety issues. So another key focus is on the need to look at the degree to which um, overprescription of medication is actually really negatively impacting the person through side effects or you know dangerous um, effects or toxic effects or whatever. Um, so that's something really important to look at as well. <laughs> As practitioners, one of the resources we can go to is the TGA website. So going to the website, what is this medication therapeutically indicated to treat? Um, often that's a good resource to say, okay, it's not therapeutically indicated for that, so it must be restrictive. We also need to ask, well, what is the intent of is, is the intent to manage a behaviour associated with, you know, for example, autism. So there's some, yeah, some ways that we can start to look at what well, is it or isn't it. Um, also providing information to is on um, other methods that we're trying, other proactive strategies that we're trying, and is the behaviour increasing so that they can make also be part of that decision making around well, you know, maybe we can reduce that chemical restraint. Did I see a question at the back? Oh, I just had a, I had a thought or a comment that I've worked with a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, so I wondering coming back to the point earlier becoming their long-term outcome, is there scope for that in what we're looking at from a structural perspective? Can we look at that as an area to break? Once they're medicated, it's much harder yeah. to come out with, and the fade out plan is much more to look at those areas and is there scope as practitioners and as a, I guess as a group that we're not kind of you know chasing our tail that yeah. we're proactively looking at, you know, other things Yeah, I think I think that the like if you're noting, okay, during transitions things get a bit rocky and we're we're leaning on medication, but is there other things we can be doing to support a 
a transition from somebody where we don't have to resort to medication and take a more proactive and preventative approach in the first instance, I think that's the dream. <laughs> I think that's the dream of the Quality and Safeguards Commission, and it's what we're trying to, um, the messaging to get out there. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of people are in a crisis situation. So um, there's always going to be those situations where um, we need a, we need something that we can do right away. Or somebody who's in crisis. But I, I totally agree with what you're saying. I suppose a couple of points. Um, Look, I think an early intervention kind of approach would be useful, and I think part of the problem is related to the um, the siloed approach uh, in, in terms of everyone gets funding for their specific task, but there's no governance and accountability over what people do, if that kind of makes sense. So um, you, you can get people pulling in completely different directions because there's not um, agreement about what the nature of the problem is and what kind of approach is going to work best. But my, my starting point is, is, is usually along the lines of, well, people with an intellectual disability should be treated just in the same way as everyone else. And if it was you or I being given medication that we couldn't consent to for some reason, it would actually be under the mental health effect. But for some reason, we're treating people with a disability as being different from that. It's ended up being under a disability act. And that goes back to my kind of question along the lines of, is this disability act actually discriminatory against people with an intellectual disability? Because it actually authorises um, the implementation of restrictive practices, which just seems bizarre to me, because why would you want a disability act that actually allows you then to apply restrictive practices to someone with an intellectual disability? So I think the solutions lie uh, in these conceptual policy and legislative kind of like approaches that are just 10, 20 years off being changed. And, and, and until that kind of point, we're always going to struggle at this kind of like the coalface with those kind of things we're not being supported by the service system to be able to deliver the kind of services that people want and you find these little pockets that i think you were describing where you get together with like-minded people and you kind of through goodwill can get things to work but they're not supported by the service system and i think chad that um, in terms of those restrictive practices that go on in the system, they've been happening for a very, very, very long time. And I think the Disability Act was brought around to legalise what was already been going on in the system. But now, all these years later, yeah, I think it's time for a review. Mm. Um, I could start talking about supervised treatment orders, but I won't. <laughs> Any further questions from there's, there's, there's several more questions. I mean, I'll get them all. Um, this is one more about um, funding from Mark Modra. Um, what can we do to address the lack of funding for in vivo and ongoing PBS training and support for workers? This is important, especially for those situations where behaviors of concern are extreme and where there's a real need for extraordinary supports and ongoing access to PBS practitioners. Why not? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we do is around the reports that we give to NDIS, um, where we step out what's needed, how much hours is required to do it, and how much they will cost. Um, I remember when we used to get funding for 10 hours assessment, and that was it. So over time, we but the capacity of the NDIS to understand what a functional behaviour assessment is um, through showing them what they'll get for their money. NDIS don't like throwing money willy-nilly. You've got to justify what you want it for. And we've found that stepping it out um, in our reports has been really helpful. And contact me, Mark, and I can explain further. Oh, yeah, just on that, <coughs> I think So there's also a, a review going on, uh, co-chaired by uh, Bruce Bonahan uh, on the overall system. So I think that it's timely. I think if people feel strongly to uh, to put a submission into the review. Uh, half uh, from a housing perspective uh, put a submission and we had a dialogue a week and a half ago. So now's the time. Um, and I think that as a service provider, with a service provider hat on, 
that's probably a great challenge. I think over the last couple of years I've seen some great reports uh, or positive behaviour strategies not fully implemented because of lack of funding from a, a training the staff and, and, and being able to sustain the, the team, particularly in complex situations. So, and I think the other thing that I know the agency is uh, leaning into is the, the unregistered the, uh, ABN workers in the sector and the proliferation because uh, that has implications in relation to uh, positive behaviour and restrictive practices. Yeah. I know that, um, that positive behavior support can appear to be a very complex area of practice because there are so many parts to it. And that can lead us perhaps to want to develop very complex assessments and reports and plans. But I actually think we need to simplify. We need to go back to the basics and focus on one or a few things at a time and really focusing on supporting the implementation of those things that are probably going to have the biggest impact. Because people need to be successful. They need to see the successful outcomes of their implementation efforts. <laughs> and so if we ask people to do things that they can't do and they're never successful, they're going to turn away from wanting to work with us. I also think that <clears throat> In simplifying, we need to reduce the amount of time that we spend writing. We need to reduce the amount of time that we spend writing reports and writing behavior support plans that are 150 pages long that could be published as an autobiography of a person. I am a big fan of very short, quick, and dirty assessments and reports. And let's just get into the implementation coaching. And let's keep the documents really easy read, really user friendly, really practical, and and look at these things not as a one one off thing that we do, but as a living and breathing process and document that continuously evolves. So it's like never done. Like your BSP is never done. It's never written because it's always evolving. And um, I think there's support within the commission for adopting that approach. But I think it's going to take some work to ensure that what needs to be lodged with the commission and what represents what people are actually doing in practice, they're more similar. So people don't feel like they have to be preparing two different types of documentations for two different purposes. You just reminded me of that interesting model I saw in Cardiff where the behavior support practitioners would actually go on the um, uh, house roster and actually work as support staff. So they'd be modeling, training, yes. observing, rather than just coming in and getting reports. And yep. that seems to work quite well. Yep, walk the walk. I don't think we're getting to that. Yes. Great. Oh, great. Yes. <laughs> the best, yeah. Thank you. How do we meet that? And I think the commission that's going to be, how do we meet those quality indicators right. and the legislative requirements? but also have an ICT web document. Um, we were only just yesterday talking about that exact thing. Yes, a person might have 10 or 12 different behaviours. Which ones do we focus on? Because you need to just hone in on a couple. What are the quick wins? And we came across a, a tool whereby we could assess which of those behaviours and how we should prioritise working on those things first rather than coming in um, support workers with, you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do this. Simplify it down. You know, having been in that direct care where the sites came in and gave us a plan and said, here, do this, and that's not going to work. Um, it, it's really um, it's really important to do what we do in a way that support workers can actually implement and how we train them, go and walk the walk beside them. Be there in the house, be there in the streets, and yeah, and role model the strategies that you're recommending. I'm not saying anything else. <laughs> yeah. We are coming towards the end of the time. There is one more question online, so if there's any last minute questions in the room, get ready. I'll ask this one. Um, no, I've lost it. It was about um, how do we extend. Um, Scroll down and scroll back up again. It's a lot of
and it was about um, how do we get PBS into hospitals and aged care uh, where they do not qualify for NDIS funding. Um, they do. <laughs> Some do, some don't. Yeah. Um, we're starting to get a lot of referrals from nursing homes and hospitals that people who are coming out, either coming out of hospital who have NDIS claims or people in nursing homes that have, are funded partly by NDIS and uh, there was different practices in there. Um, I guess the way would be to talk to, yeah, are they already out, ready on NDIS? Do they need to be on NDIS and go through that um, eligibility process to get them on NDIS in the first place so that they can then get <coughs> funding for PBS? Yeah, I think it's, it's both a like, bottom-up and a top-down process. From a bottom-up perspective, we could just get a few people that are working in those settings to become the PBS champion and upscale and then start to make some small changes within those organizations that can support uh, support people or start to address some of the, the, I guess, most pressing concerns in those environments. Um, we'll have some individual champions working as part of multidisciplinary teams that can start to like infuse some of the PBS way of thinking into those types of settings, but also from a top-down perspective, there needs to be resourcing and time and um, a, a leadership commitment to adopting a PBS approach and um, bringing people together to work collaboratively. And as we've kind of mentioned several times, like the issue of silos is one that's really challenging to overcome, particularly when funding goes to those organizations from multiple different buckets and there's multiple different pieces of legislation that sort of dictate how you work in those settings. And um, I know it, there is definitely a lot of um, scope for PBS in aged care, and there are some really nice, can't think of where off the top of my head, but there are some really nice examples in the literature of how the strategies have been used with individuals um, in aged care facilities that might be struggling with communication due to dementia or stroke. And it's not about teaching new skills necessarily, but it's about maintaining choice and independence later in life and it's really simple things that can be done in those settings but um yeah it's a big one chad not easy <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I guess there's two answers to that question one is that you wait for the hospitals and the aged care setting to develop their own internal capacity to provide that kind of services um, I think the other kind of problem is related to silos and resources, but uh, if you're running a hospital, I don't know that you can allow other people to come into that hospital and tell your staff what to do. So that I think there's the governance issue in trying to implement um, positive behaviour support in another institutional setting that you don't have that kind of um, accountability to that organisation. And I think that they'd be very reluctant to, 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 for someone to just come in and tell their staff how to, how, to, how to work and do stuff. So I don't know that it's possible. And that goes back to the siloing of resources. Yes, the, the times that we've been into nursing homes and um, dementia wards and psych wards in hospitals, it's, it's about, you know, we're introducing a completely foreign concept to them. So that's very slow building their capacity to, to understand, but they're not set up to support PBS or restrictive practice or any of those things. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. How we find it? Maybe the corporates. <laughs> One more question. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, Luke Delaney, I'm a Kind of talk from the other side of the fence, perhaps, on this issue. So I'm a neuropsychologist, and I work in the Applied Brain Injury Unit at uh, Alfred Health, Corbin Hospital. And um, there are huge challenges in this space. I'm also a specialist behaviour support practitioner, and Alfred Health over the last year has registered to deliver behaviour support services, which is a big part of the answer to the question, I think. Um, 
it's incredibly difficult for health services to deliver disability <coughs> services, and there are, there are massive challenges there, which I just want to mention but not get into. The way that we're uh, the way that we're doing this is that we actually, so we're getting a, a quiet brain injury and we have a lot of uh, folk who unfortunately have restricted practices at the point of, excuse me, at the point of discharge. So uh, often chemical restraint, but they sometimes need environmental restraint as well. And we found there were massive barriers in actually facilitating their discharge. We are able to bring NDIS behaviour support practitioners in. We have done that over time, but it's not easy to come in from the outside into a hospital setting, do your functional behaviour assessment and uh, come up with a plan that's really sensible and, and workable. So we now do that. Uh, we prepare the interim behaviour support plan and then we, the aim is we then identify a practitioner in the community and we hand over. And so we have a transition period. So that's a model that I think has a lot of upside to it. Can I say one thing? I think from a research perspective, what I'm really interested in doing moving forward is identifying examples of programs like what you've just described, where they're innovating and they're doing something that maybe you no know, people, we haven't really explained it to the wider community, but like, wow, look what you guys are doing. That's really cool. How can we do more case studies of like these different innovative appro approaches that different settings are using to be able to learn from each other. So rather than just focusing from a research perspective on where are the challenges and what's really difficult, but rather take a more appreciative approach and say, well, where are the pockets of really good practice or really innovative practice? And how can we go in and learn about what you're doing and kind of write up um, a little bit of a case study around that. So I think there's real potential to focus on um, what providers are doing that is new and innovative and, and sort of um, breaking down some of these silos. And that's kind of an area that I, moving forward, would be really interested in, in doing some work in. Okay, one, one last question. One last question from online. Um, it was let's see, um, from Kit Katrina. Uh, from the perspective of PWD and the family accessing PBS, when is when is a junior practitioner under supervision of a senior practitioner? Should the consumer be told of this and also meet with the supervising practitioner? Okay, wait. There's a lot of moving parts here. <clears throat> so you've got a team. And you've got a senior practitioner coming in who I'm assuming is more a behavior support practitioner who's going to be developing the program and um, taking more of that um, supervisory role in terms of um, developing strategies and coaching and implementation. And then you have a junior practitioner who is maybe playing more of an implementation role. Maybe I feel that parents and individuals or families and individuals with disability have the right to make informed decisions about the supports that are being provided to them and who is delivering those supports. So I feel that everybody who's going to be working on the team needs to communicate with each other and the family needs to be informed of who is on the team, their roles and responsibilities and the nature of the relationships. That is in the spirit of informed consent. So I would say, um, that it should be very transparent to everyone. Right. Yeah. I think kind of in, in, in kind of where we actually kind of go overboard, mm -hmm. and it's, it's like the privacy legislation when it's applied to people with infectious disease, it actually makes it much harder to get the information you need to treat them. And it's the same with um, uh, consent. So. We're looking at doing a, 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 a project with people with intellectual disability, but just because it involves people with intellectual disability, it's deemed high risk. So the kind of approaches we have to go through to get that approved actually means that we can't do the project. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of look at it as a slightly different kind of way, and this is kind of like how we'd approach it, is that when you come to a hospital, it's a hospital's responsibility to ensure that the person providing the service is deemed qualified to deliver that service. And that's all you're consenting to. And 
you're not in a position to know that. You know, so like we might send out a junior doctor, but it's only once they've been endorsed to be able to do that, provide that kind of service or activity. So I'd actually see it as the organisation's responsibility to ensure that the person who's going to do whatever it is they're doing is appropriately qualified and in order to do that, and that's what the person consents to. Otherwise, you get into this big pool park of trying to provide so much information to people that you know they kind of get overwhelmed with, with the choices. And it's a bit like mobile phone plans. I mean, kind of like trying to make a choice about that kind of stuff for insurance. It's just, it gets too hard. I agree with both of those. Um, yeah. I guess it's harder. I, yeah, I agree on being open and transparent with um, the participant, the family, those that you're working with around, you know, what qualifications you have, what background, what experience you have, and that you have someone else who oversees your work and who that person might be. Um, but also agree with Chad, and I think that's a, a challenge for the NDIS. And yes, we've got core and efficient and advanced level core competencies, um, how do we determine when someone of a core competency is, I mean, they can't meet the criteria without doing the work. So it's kind of like having their hours on for a period. And so, yeah, I think we need to be transparent. We've also got to give people the opportunity to know that well, we wouldn't employ someone that couldn't do the role either. Yeah, where does that accountability lie? I guess it sits with us as employers to employ people who can do the job and that we do oversee what they do and how they do it. Okay, I think we're, um, we're out of time, so I think we'll have to wrap it up. I'll just Thank you to everybody online for hanging in there throughout the, the panel discussion. We've certainly had some fantastic creative questions and there's certainly a long way to go in this field, but it's certainly pro progressed a lot in the last 30 years. I think it's progressed a lot in the last two years. <laughs> since, since I can make it like but yeah. Six weeks. And a lot of great work going on. And um, I think it's been a very valuable session this morning to um, hear the in-depth presentation from Dr. Aaron and to have the opportunity to have the discussion and pose, you know, questions, difficult questions, curly questions. Um, and even if we don't have all the answers, um, I think it's good to come together in a community of practice and to uh, have the discussions and progress and build the capacity of the workforce. So hopefully we're contributing to that um, at Harris Allied Health. And um, as I said, always recruiting. So check out our website. Um, so I'd like to thank um, Megan for facilitating. I'd very much like to thank Dr. Aaron for your wonderful presentation and your participation today, and Dr. Chad for um, joining us and participating. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.